You wanna know how you've kind of disrupted the market a little bit, especially when you're AMD? You get a company like EVGA to build an AMD product. Bring your entire setup together with IQ from Corsair. Customize lighting effects by choosing from a vast selection of presets or create your own using custom lighting features allowing you to synchronize your battle station to your own taste and style. IQ also allows for full system monitoring and control including fan speeds, lighting and more, all from a single interface. To see all that IQ from Corsair has to offer, follow the sponsored link in the description below. So what we've got right here is EVGA's X570 Dark. If you guys aren't aware of like the, the level of which uh, EVGA sort of names their products. Dark is at the top. Like this, this is also kind of like Kingpin's deal. Anything dark means it has Kingpin's input and design, Kingpin and Tin, uh, their design and, and their philosophy built into a product. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna open it up, we're gonna kind of, kind of take a first look, and we're gonna boot it up and look at the BIOS because I'm most curious as to what sorts of options we get in the BIOS because one of the things too that the dark boards have been all about, whether it's the X299 boards or, because remember our, our XOC stuff was usually done on either a, um, a Z590 dark or an X299 dark, now potentially an X570 dark. The philosophy there is unlocked. You can turn off all the checks and balances there and if you want to blow your stuff up, go right ahead, we'll let you do it. And that's also how you typically get the best scores is you just kind of go for broke and you bite your thumbnails and your fingernails and you hope you didn't screw it up in some way. So right on the top, we're greeted with a little envelope. What's in here? Installation quick guide. The presentation's already nice. Check this out. Accessory kit. So, you know, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna rewind here for a second. We were made aware of this board early, as most influencers and, and, and those in the tech space are. And it was a few months ago, and, and when I was told like, hey, keep this on the down low, but here's what we're working on. You know what my exact response was? Don't f it up, because Asus and Gigabyte and MSI, Gigabyte slash Aorus and, and ASRock and all of them, they've been making uh, motherboards for AMD all along. And I've showed you guys in the past, especially with the FX boards, how the difference in quality between an Intel product and an AMD product always showed chintziness or, or cheapness of materials when it comes to AMD stuff. And the, the, the other thing that always bothered me about AMD not AMD itself, but the motherboard manufacturers is, is, the, is the wonkiness. It's the weirdness of like USB disconnects and, and the BIOS just kind of being crap or having uh, constant BIOS releases because they're fixing bugs that are implemented by the manufacturer itself. Like Asus is an amazing brand when it comes to the aesthetics and the design and it looks pretty. But we've had so many weird problems on any of our AMD systems here, which are all running AMD or uh, uh, Asus motherboards to where I went, this could be great or it could be terrible. And I don't want this to be like when EVGA first went into motherboards back in like the Z67 era and, the, and, and all of that where they actually like wiped the entire motherboard design team, hired all new engineers and staff and rebuilt the product stack from the bottom up. EVGA motherboards, in my opinion, especially on the Intel side, I don't know about the AMD side yet, we're gonna find out, which is not something I ever thought in my, in my entire life I would say, an AMD EVGA motherboard. I don't think you should get excited about EVGA AMD GPUs. I don't think that'll ever happen. But then again, I said this would never happen. They, they have an opportunity here to make it great and I don't want this to be a repeat of what happened with the old motherboards on the Intel side of stuff. So, TED Talk over, accessory kit, here's what you get. This is where you're gonna have all your holy antennas. Holy and Hannah Montana, look at that, antenna. <laughs> that is a really stiff cable. <laughs> okay, look, it's even the EVJ logo. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, oh, you do get the, the motherboard standoff thing. So all dark boards do come with a test bench standoff motherboard thing you can like mount it down on. These are screws. It even says right there, screw. Probit cable. Yeah, so all dark motherboards, shut up, Phil. <laughs> so all dark motherboards do come with this, uh, th this attachment here that attaches to the motherboard and it gives you an easy spot to use your multimeter to check for voltages and stuff going to different aspects of the motherboard. So you can't trust software voltage control or vol voltage readouts. If, you are, are, if you're trying to get down to the nitty gritty of XOC or extreme overclocking, you need something like this where you can use hardware-based monitoring in terms of voltage to see what's happening. So that's what this is, that's, that's on every dark motherboard. A bunch of extra screws here, which are gonna be M.2 thermal pads, M.2 screws. Um, 
Looks like another M.2 screw hole down right there. Your EVGA badge, which is metal. I love that their badges are metal. That's if you're into putting badges on your case. And then we've got our um, 180s and 90 degree SATA cables right there. So the accessory stuff, pretty standard for EVGA, all the same stuff that you would see in any uh, other dark motherboard. But obviously, this isn't why you're here. This, oh my goodness. Okay, if weight is an indicator of quality, then that's a quality thing right there. So here's the board. Uh, what I love about this, the standoffs that they give you, because the idea here is XOC, right? You're not gonna put it in a case. You are going to just, you're gonna set it on a test bench or something. I love this because it's actually a PCB. It's the same like PCB material they make it out of and it's all printed like exactly what's what. And what also makes this awesome is the fact that it's labeled. So if you needed to go in here and solder something or repair something, a lot of the XOC guys are also very good solderers and they'll go in and repair their own caps or chokes or something that can die. They'll actually go in here and replace it themselves. So this not only works as a standoff, it's also a schematic. This, this right here, this is why you're here. Never thought in my life I would be holding an EVGA AMD product. And it's pretty, look at that. You might notice right away the weird orientation of the CPU and the RAM. And the reason for that, and this is something they actually started with, I believe, Z490, maybe Z390. They found that getting all the power together, 24 pin and your two eight pin EPS right there, allows for a cleaner uh, and shorter power delivery system to the CPU. It's like, why stick power way up here in the corner and then have to route it past all these other SMDs and things on the surface of the motherboard that could, that could give you some bleed over or some sort of crosstalk between uh, EMF. Why not put them all together and have the shortest run possible to the CPU? And by doing that, they had to turn the CPU to have a short run. So that's why you see the CPU angled and the RAM in this weird spot at the top. In terms of the phase setup, I'm not even entirely sure of what the, the phase setup is on this. I'll have to look, but I can tell you right now, whatever it is, it's got a handle a pretty serious amount of, uh, of core count because this will support obviously up to a 5950X, which is a 16 core, 32 thread CPU. This amount of mainstream coreage, I really screwed that tear off. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's just, oh, my. oh, here's the little pull tab, it's on this side. <laughs> if we take a look at the power delivery, it's beefy. Not only is the, is the power delivery beefy, look at the heat sink on that guy. I mean, that, that's like, that's probably more cooling in the power delivery system of like many box coolers that come for CPUs these days. And that's the thing. People don't realize that when you go XOC or, or, or any sort of overclocking, or heck, not even just overclocking, just standard usage of something that has that many cores and that many threads uh, means that You've got to have a power delivery system that's beefy, and having a beefy power delivery system also means you have to cool it. You'll notice there's only two sticks of RAM, or two, two DIMM slots. And the reason for that, we've talked about this in the past, is when it comes to memory controllers, especially with memory controllers that are on CPUs now, because both Ryzen and Intel, the memory controllers are on chip, not on the motherboard, that uh, having single DIMM per channel is the way you get the most stable memory in the fastest speeds. If you're not having to split that data between two different DIMMs on the same channel, you're able to get uh, lower latency when it comes to the memory response, especially when it comes to memory timings, which means that having one stick per channel is how you're gonna get the best amount of uh, speed and latency out of your RAM. Now, if you're building this system and trying to get the most RAM possible because you're just a lover of EVGA and the dark series, and you're doing things like content creation where you need to have the most RAM possible, minimum 32 gigabytes in many instances, then you're gonna have to go with 16 gigabyte sticks in here. I don't know if this would support two 32 gigabyte sticks. Um, it's possible, but that's the downside about going with anything branded for XOC and designed for XOC is you're gonna have a limited capacity of RAM because of the, the limited amount of sticks. Obviously, if you're going full content creation, you wanna go AMD, we would recommend Threadripper because of the fact that it's quad channel and then you can have up to eight sticks of RAM in that. However, I don't know if I would necessarily buy Threadripper right now because a little birdie tells me Threadripper 5000 series is probably only a short time away. So in terms of connectivity, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, USB 3.0. Four of them are the uh, 10 gigabit. We've actually got a USB-C 3.0 Gen 3, 3, 3 point whatever. 
USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-C. We actually got a PS2 port, which is nice. I know that doesn't stand for PlayStation 2. Two uh, 2.5 gigabit Ethernet ports. So no 10 gigabit, but two 2.5s, which is kind of nice. And then your standard SPDIF and your outputs here for audio. Look at the beefiness of that chipset cooler. Look at that. That sucker is beefy. So in terms of PCIe 2, we've got two slots. Um, this is obviously going to support SLI because Dark is all about XOC and 3090s do SLI. And if you look at the leaderboards on any of the, uh, the Time Spy and Port Royal and all that sort of stuff, SLI is obviously on there, including our score. It's still there. And you got one 4X down here, which could be for like a capture card, sound card, NIC card, um, maybe a, a M.2 card, something. So you got one of those. Not a whole lot of connectivity when it comes to the PCIe and all that, but that's because, again, this board designed for extreme overclocking. We've got on the bottom here two USB 2.0, which is nice. I've seen a lot of motherboards actually omit USB 2.0, and that's just because of the fact that they think everyone's going USB 3, but if you've got your AIOs or you've got your uh, lighting controllers and stuff, usually they need a standard 2.0 port header. So you've got two of those right there. We've got supplemental six pin PCI Express power down here. That's because if you're running like two overclocked 3090s, we've shown with our keen pin cards when you're running XOC that there'll be like 600 watts or more per card. Um, you need to have supplemental power here. That way you don't overload the PCI Express 75 watt power delivery. So it can supplement and pull from there, not through the traces in the motherboard, which is all about stability and obviously not burning out the headers. USB 3.0, uh, one of them right here. I thought there was a second one somewhere, but there's not. Real time QR readout or Q code readout up here. So this, is really, this really helps with diagnosing any sort of a no post or no boot issue. It'll pause on a number and you can look that up in the manual and find out exactly what it's pausing on. And this is also really cool right here too. The, it has a BIOS flashback utility, but it's on the motherboard itself. It's not in the back. So if you need to do a BIOS flashback, uh, EVJ does have that functionality as well. And it's right here on the top. This is where you plug in your SD card or your uh, flash memory or thumb drive or whatever. One, two, three, four RGB headers. Two 12 volt, two five volt addressable, which is something that EVGA hasn't had on their boards in the past. They had some lighting built onto their board, but they didn't have any sort of headers to control third party uh, lighting devices. Now you do. And they're all together at the bottom down here, which could, may or may not be the best routing, but you know, they're there. And then of course we've got fan headers galore. One of the things that EVJ has never skimped on when it comes to their motherboards is the amount of fan headers they give you because a lot of heat requires a lot of cooling. And as such, you have a lot of uh, options here for that. One, two, three. There's a three BIOS motherboard. So you can have different BIOS setups uh, saved based on configurations. So you can have one, two, and three. We also have the EVGA slow mode switch down here, which really helps with cold boots if you have to do it. So here, when you bring the temps down really, really low on XOC and you have things that are starting to get frozen on the board, you have a limited amount of time to do things. And if you have to do a restart, sometimes the system will not boot if it's too cold. That actually helps it boot uh, when it's already down into its freezing temps. Let's boot it up. Let's take a look inside the BIOS. I am most curious about what controls we get in the BIOS. So we got our little setup going here, which is looks very EVGA inspired, obviously, with our EVGA power supply and our EVGA graphics card. They didn't, they didn't, this isn't a paid for video or anything. I just figured why not match the brands because you can. Stock cooler on there. We are running a 3950X. This board is actually supports 3000 and 5000 series. I have a 5600X and my 5900X and my 5950X are uh, currently being utilized in our systems. And then my 5800X went into a build that was actually for someone else. So I figured we'll just go to the 3950X because it's supported and it's also a high core count CPU. But what all we care about is what are the options that we're gonna see inside of the BIOS. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this on. One thing you might notice right away is that the X570 dark logo isn't dark. This is the first dark motherboard I think that has any sort of lighting built into it. All right, here we go. So this is typical. CMOS checksum error, CPU memory have changed. You want to enter setup? Yes. So far this looks exactly the same as we've seen with uh, any of the previous boards in the past. So Roma default system settings, enter setup, gamer mode, set a conservative overclock, and EVGA OC robot. The OC robot right now, what that's gonna do is it's gonna run a series of checks at certain frequencies, certain voltages, and check for temperature. And then what will happen over time is it will then just continue to push. See, it just pushed it up now, 100 megahertz. See, here's the problem. A lot of motherboards will say, hey, we've tested 100 CPUs or 300 CPUs. I, I think some of the brands have said they test as much as 300 to 500 different CPUs of the same SKU to find where those like median, here's where every CPU was able to go and then they'll do that. This one actually tests each one 
individually like this. So you see it keeps bumping the frequency, bumps the voltage, and then it keeps an eye on CPU. It will go as far as where the CPU uh, headroom and voltage is considered safe to give you your overclock. So right now it's actually overclocking on the Wraith cooler, which by the way, I didn't, if I had an AIO or something set up to this or a water cooler, this would be a lot lower, which will allow that to go higher, which will allow that to go higher. But look, it's just 70% uh, done right now in OC tuning. You can see a little progress bar right here. Let's just see where it lands. And then we'll check out where the, uh, what, what kind of settings we get. Oh, I thought I put the 3950X in there. One of two things happened. I wanted to see if there was anything, you know, maybe that's uh, available on 5000 series that's not on 3000 series, or I'm just stupid. Both are highly probable. Press apply. Fine, let's apply that. Okay, so it's gonna reboot. EVGA's BIOS, in my opinion, is amongst the simplest. Strips out most of the garbage you just don't need or care about, which makes it the, the, just the best overclocking experience because of the fact that so much of it handles itself. Plus, it's, they, don't, they don't bore you with the settings you just don't need. This all looks identical. This looks exactly as I'm expecting it to look. Shows you exactly what's connected to your PCIe lanes. So you can see we have one PCI Express 16X 3 point Gen 3 device set up. That's our graphics card. Here's our memory size. So apparently those are 16 gigabyte sticks right there. Holy cow. You don't even know any of the parts in this computer. I just grabbed them from the shelf. <laughs> it's going down the way everyone thinks it happens. All right, so let's see what we've got for overclocking here. Overclocking, we have multiplier control, all core or per CCX. F clock frequency, so that's our fabric clock. That's set to auto. That's usually gonna be half the rate of whatever the memory is set to. And then the U clock divider mode. Um, B clock frequency, so that's like base clock. Extreme voltage and LN2 mode, those unlock when you uh, have proper cooling on there, so you would disable those, that way you can undo any of the limitations when it comes to voltage. It just allows you to push things a lot higher. Here's our V-Core setting, CPU SOC, v, uh, VDDP, all this stuff you would play with if you were doing extreme overclocking, none of it really matters for us. But I love the fact that they break memory out from a separate tab. So we can actually go in here and enable the 3200 megahertz profile, it tightens the timings. It tells you what your current timings are in an easy to see spot. So you can see it would be tightening up the uh, TCL by two clock speeds. Those are the same, same, same. And then it really tightens up the, the reference clock right here, uh, or the TRAS. SMT, that's simultaneous multi-threading. You could turn off hyper threading if you wanted. Core control, one per CCX, two, three, four, five per CCX. This is awesome. So this is the kind of stuff that I was hoping to see where we can actually break it all out individually. So precision boost overdrive, that is the uh, auto overclocking built into AMD. So we could set the PBO limits uh, of precision boost overdrive, the scaler, the max boost clock override. Now other motherboards give us a max of 200. What's this one gonna give us? A max of 200. So that's just kind of what's built into PBO. Uh, platform thermal throttle limit. Auto or manual, you could set the temperature where it would throttle, How will it let us go? Okay, 200, it will let you go to 200C. I don't recommend you go to 200C. <laughs> I really, really don't recommend that you go to 200C. No, your processors are turning into a neutron star. Say 85 is fine. <laughs> so not a whole lot to talk about here because nothing has actually changed that I can find, which is awesome. They've just broken it down. Simple to see, simple to understand menu to make everything as simple as possible. Now, x -stress, check this out, stress test. You wanna see how hot it's gonna get? That's the same thing like you just saw us do, only what this does now is instead of going through and trying to overclock it, it's gonna run it at max voltage, max frequency, so that you can see over time what happens to the temperatures. So I love this because if you wanna know if your settings are gonna be too hot under load, for, and this is a different kind of load, obviously. It's not like an ABX instruction type of, type of load, but it is a load nonetheless. Before ever leaving the BIOS, after you've applied your settings, you can test for, test for one stability and temperatures. So we could play around with our overclocks without ever leaving the BIOS, which gets you a good starting point without going, okay, oh good, it posted. We're in operating system, oh, blue screen. So you can find a spot here at which you're comfortable and then go and test it in your real world application. Can this CPU dare do a 5.0 all core overclock at stock voltage? Now remember, this is just a good starting point for your overclocks and, and your stress testing. It's not recommended to be like, oh, this is stable. This is just, yeah, see it just locked up right there. This is designed to see what can you get away with before you ever go to the operating system.
The EVGA X570 Dark, it's pricey. It's extremely pricey. It's over $600. So is every other dark board that's ever existed. So that shouldn't be surprising to anyone that's familiar with the dark motherboard and is, I'm gonna go back to EVGA OC Robot to undo what I did. But it, it, if you're familiar with the dark and what it's meant to do, what it stands for, the price shouldn't surprise you. But what also might surprise you is it's not the most expensive AMD motherboard on the market. That uh, X570 Godlike from MSI that we took a look at was over $700. So it, things are getting pricey, but that's the price you pay if you want the absolute top tier best that you can get on the market. So would I pair a 5600X with this motherboard? No. 5900X, 5950X for sure. 58 maybe. But I would rather spend less on a motherboard and get a higher tier CPU if it meant I could only afford a 5600X after spending this much on a motherboard. But EVJ knows who their clientele is with this board. That clientele is going to buy it. If anything, there's already concerns about stock shortages on this as it is. And, and by that, it's just the amount of people that are going to buy this up going, oh my God, EVJ made an AMD motherboard. I have to have it. That sounds fanboyish, but it's happening. So anyway, sound off in the comments down below what you guys think about the EVJ X570 Dark. I'm surprised it has LEDs and LED control on it, but that just shows people want it. Therefore, they implemented it. I know someone might be like, it's expensive because they put RTBs in there. It probably cost them a few extra dollars to implement that. And I bet you that had no bearing on the price of the board whatsoever. The multi-layer PCB design, all of the power delivery design on this, the way the CPU's turned and the new traces designed for the power delivery and its XOC capability, triple BIOS, all the features on the motherboard itself, all the headers, all that sort of stuff is why this board is expensive as it is. Thanks guys, sound off down below if you would even consider buying an EVGA AMD product or if you're gonna wait and see how this motherboard uh, is received over long-term user reports because this is, after all, EVGA's first time building an AMD motherboard. They've got a lot of motherboard building experience with Intel, but it doesn't always all translate over to the other brand. So, sound off down below what you guys think about this board and as always, we'll see you in the next one.